This week's Armored Adventure brings me back to one of my very favorite places on Earth, the National Armor and Cavalry Collection at Fort Moore in Georgia. This video is sponsored by Micropros and the new game Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks. This isn't the usual sort of tank game that you've probably seen around. It's out on Steam in its early access phase. And if you like tanks, I mean, if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. If you like tanks and you're specifically interested in tank development, I suggest you give it a look. The game starts in the World War One era of armor, which is kind of different. Um, this collection is easily the best place in the US to see American armor of that era. So we'll take a look today at one of the oldest vehicles in the collection, and I'll turn the camera over to the curator to speak on it. Hello there, I'm Rob Kogan, the curator here at the US Army Armor and Cavalry Collection. And today I wanna to talk to you about what I think is our most important tank uh, within our training and support facility here at Fort Moore, Georgia. So come with me. This tank here is our British built Mark V Star. The Mark V Star was introduced in the summer of 1918 by the British Army. Uh, it is a very vast improved version of the original Mark I, Mark II, and Mark IV tanks that saw combat previously. Uh, some of the big improvements between the Mark IV and the Mark V was the uh, rearrangement and improvement of the braking system, whereas on the Mark IV and the earlier tanks required two brakemen in the back, one on each side, which meant that it took three people to steer. The Mark V uh, had a much more streamlined process, only required one person to actually drive and steer this vehicle, uh, but still requires a lot of crew members in order to man it. This actually would have had 11 personnel on board. You would have the driver in the front, a sergeant mechanic in the back. If you think uh, Scotty from Star Trek down, down on the engineering deck trying to keep the Starship run, it's the same thing on World War I tanks. You have a sergeant mechanic in the back trying to keep this vehicle going through battle. You would have the tank commander who would sit in the back. He actually had his own armored cupola on top of the tank, which was another difference between the Mark IV and the Mark V. Uh, from there, he command and controlled the whole vehicle. And then the rest of your crew members, you would have had two cannoneers, your gunners, uh, two loaders, which would have assisted those gunners. And then the rest of your personnel would have been machine gunners who would actually move across and around the tank. There are a lot of machine gun positions on board this vehicle, uh, but I would point out at most points, they're only carrying four to six machine guns. You wouldn't have machine guns on every position. And the whole point was as the tank goes in the battle, the machine gunners could actually move the machine guns around the vehicle. Uh, to where they were needed, depending on the direction of travel versus the enemy's uh, direction. Now, what makes this particular tank a Mark V Star, Mark V Asterisk, as it looks on paper? Well, a Mark V versus a Mark V Star, Mark V is actually about six feet shorter. And one of the things they do with the Mark V Star design is they add six feet to the center part of the hull. Why are they doing that? Well, it's because the Germans, realizing that they can't always have the weaponry to kill these tanks, even though they are using pieces like field artillery, uh, some of the earliest anti-tank guns, anti-tank rifles like the Teague of Air. One of the things they think about is, well, what if we make our frontline trenches a little bit wider so that these tanks can't cross? Uh, it's very much like the caveman tactic of trapping a mammoth before killing it. And so they start making the trenches wider, so the British naturally act by making the tanks longer. And that's why you have the Mark V Star. Now, this particular Mark V Star is what is known as a male variant, which means it carried cannons. The way the British doctrine worked is in a platoon of five tanks, two usually carried cannons. Their job would have been against built up bunkers, machine gun nests, and then the other tanks, the other three tanks in a platoon would be all machine guns. And really the machine gun tank was actually seen as the main tank because their job would then would be to actually drive over the trenches suppress the enemy infantry, suppress any other machine gun nests, but then really help clear out the trenches before the British infantry came in to mop up. Uh, so this mail tank would have carried two six pound cannons, really a British naval gun adopted from the Royal Navy who did most of the original design work on what was originally called the land ship. And then like I said, several 303 Hotchkiss machine guns would have been on board as well. Uh, other points that are interesting about the Mark V, it had a six cylinder Ricardo engine that gave it a whopping 150 horsepower, put in perspective, a modern Abrams tank uh, produces over 1500 horsepower now. Uh, and it gave this giant 30 plus ton machine a top speed of five miles per hour, which World War I kind of worked because that's about the speed an infantry battalion could attack across no man's land uh, on a good day. So these tanks could still outpace the infantry behind them. Now this particular tank is special to us because this belonged to the first American tank unit to stand up. 
Uh, that was the 301st Tank Battalion, today known as 66th and 67th Armor Regiments. Uh, over the years, uh, the battalion was split up into different organizations, and today 66th and 67th Armor Regiments can trace their heritage back to both this unit as well as the Light Tank Battalions that served in the American Expeditionary Forces. Uh, the 301st stood up in the spring of 1918. They then ship overseas to Bovington, England at the British Tank School, home of the tank and still their tank school today. And they trained there for several months on British tanks. And they used these Mark V's for the first time in September 29th, 1918 at the Battle of St. Quentin Canal, an assault against the German Hindenburg Line. Now, this attack pretty much went wrong in all ways possible. Uh, which is pretty impressive because the, the 301st still makes it to their objectives. It's not the glorious victory they're looking for, but they still get the job done. Uh, what makes it so chaotic is, first of all, the American units they were supporting uh, in the U.S. Second Corps, the day before, did not meet all their objectives. They were about a thousand yards short. So the 301st, with several British tank units, conduct the first night attack ever when they attack in the middle of the night uh, on the 20th. 28th going to the 29th, the whole idea is they have to clear the first thousand yards that the American infantry units were supposed to clear and then conduct their attack against the Hindenburg line. They're actually conducting two attacks for one. Uh, and like I said, this is the first time tank units have actually conducted an attack at night in the dark. It, it's, you know, they're, they're pretty much pioneers in trying to figure out how to conduct night attacks in armor. Uh, other things that go wrong. Uh, British smoke screen that was supposed to be fired, it, it was actually fired on time, but the winds changed and the smoke screen came back in their face, making it hard to see. Also combined with some autumn fog that came up in the morning. Uh, and then finally, B Company of 301st had the misfortune, they actually drove through a British minefield that had been set the previous year during the Ludendorff Offensive. Uh, and it unfortunately had not been put on any maps. And so these poor American tankers going about first time, they suddenly start seeing their tanks getting knocked out by their own side's landmines. Not, not a great way to start a war. Uh, but the A Company 301st, which used this tank, this particular tank being part of 1st Platoon, uh, their story is unique in that initially as they're going to the attack, they actually are starting to get lost. It's very dark, it's very chaotic. Their company commander, a uh, captain by the name of Kit Varney, he actually dismounts and leads them into battle on foot. Uh, literally just waving his hands, trying to keep their attention, and he gets them to the German lines. Unfortunately, he's killed by German machine gun fire, and we'll get the Distinguished Service Cross. This particular tank will knock out 17 German machine gun nests before it's struck twice by German anti-tank gun fire. Now I'm going to come over here. Now, over the years, there's been a lot of debate about exactly what took this tank out. Uh, the Germans weren't really known for having a lot of anti-tank weapons, specifically made anti-tank weapons during World War I. Uh, but the truth is, anti-tank weapons in 1918, they're actually going through their genesis. Uh, so besides the Germans using some of their heavy artillery, like their 7.7 centimeter field guns, uh, they're using weapons like the Mauser Tank of Air, but they're also starting to use some of the captured British 57mm guns from some of the other British tanks that have been knocked down in no man's land. And they actually do have early 37mm anti-tank guns. And the Hindenburg line was known for actually having a concentration of a lot of German anti-tank weapons. So we believe one of the strikes you can see down here that's been patched up uh, looking from the inside was probably one of those 37 millimeter anti-tank guns. There's also another strike on the side of the vehicle uh, on the right gun sponson that we believe was from either a similar caliber weapon, maybe potentially one of the 57 millimeters. Uh, probably would have just been armor piercing rounds because there wasn't much explosive effect in the tank, but there are signs if you look on the interior tank of engine shroud, uh, the engine shroud being blown a little bit, uh, shrapnel going everywhere. Now when those two rounds hit, they immediately kill two of the crew members uh, and then set, wound seven other of the crew members. So almost immediately, nine out of 11 crew members are knocked out in battle on board this tank. Now, when those nine crew members are taken out of action, the two surviving crew members, privates by the name of Robert Wisher and Albert Neal, uh, the first thing they do is, well, how do we save the, our crew members? And so, first thing they do is the front's facing towards the enemy, so obviously the rear of the tank's the safest spot. They're pretty much in the middle of German lines. It's very chaotic. Uh, and so what they have to do is they have to evacuate the crew members one by one through this rear hatch, which as you can see, I'm fairly average height and build. That is still pretty daunting when you imagine that they're under machine gun fire, under cannon fire, and from some of the reports, they were also under gas attack. Uh, so removing each of those crew members one by one 
through this hatch, varying degrees of injury, uh, would have been pretty daunting, and they pulled it off. Now, what do they do after they get the crew members to safety? Well, that's actually a really interesting story. First of all, one of the wounded crew members, uh, one of the cannon gunners, he is wounded, but he can still walk. He's gonna run back and get stretcher bearers for the wounded crew members who are back in cover. What did Robert Wisher and Private Albert Neal do? Well, nobody would have faulted them if they would have just gone back to the rear with the wounded, regrouped with the rest of the battalion and waited for the next attack. Uh, I think losing nine out of 11 crew members is a big deal. No, those two soldiers decided they were going to continue the mission. So Wisher and Neal, they go back to the tank, back to 9591. They dismount some of the British Hotchkiss machine guns are on board. They grab as much ammunition as they can, and they continue towards their objective in the German trenches on foot. Uh, first, they link up with a few American infantrymen. The American infantrymen, though, quickly become casualties. Uh, essentially, a statement from the American tankers is the American infantrymen simply just charge headlong in the machine gun. Wisher and Neal link up with Australian troops that were on their flank, uh, meet up with them and then using their machine guns they actually go into the German trenches and hip firing these 303 caliber machine guns start clearing out German dugouts start clearing out the fine positions for multiple hours it's not till almost noon and granted this tank was going into the Hindenburg line at about nine o'clock in the morning so for several hours they're finding these Germans on foot and then they make it back to their unit completely unscathed and for their actions for for not accepting defeat for placing their mission first for not leaving their fallen comrades they will both get distinguished service crosses from the first American enlisted soldier tankers to receive awards for valor, which is one reason why this tank is so important to us. Now, what happens to 9591 after the war? Well, 1919, uh, by that point, this tank has finally been repaired. It didn't see action again during the war, but they do get it repaired. 1919, when the battalion returns to the United States, the tank comes back with them, and almost immediately it's put out as a monument vehicle. The U.S. Army used these tanks till about 1921, but 9591 immediately became a monument tank, believe it or not, down here at what was then the infantry school at then Fort Benning, now Fort Moore, and served actually as a monument right at the main gate of post. Most people don't realize uh, that this tank actually has a history with this post. And it stayed that way. It actually moved around post a little bit with the tank school that was down here in the 1920s and 30s. And then in 1940-42 time frame, what I've been able to determine, the tank was then moved up to the new Armored Forces School at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then sat there outside till 1980s. It was then finally brought indoors. Uh, it went through some restoration work, and then uh, it was put into a diorama, what was then the Patton Museum of Cavalry and Armor, which is why you see a lot of what looks like mud on this tank. In fact, it's actually just uh, plaster and other material. Eventually, we do want to remove that. It's a very slow process, so we don't take off too much of the paint. Uh, but then the tank moved down here with us in 2011, and we're so happy to have it now here inside the train support facilities tankodrome uh, because we can now share its history as probably the oldest tank in the collection with direct connections to the first American tankers. And that's why this is our most important piece in the collection. Thank you guys so much for watching. It's always a treat to have Mr. Kogan on and speaking with his expertise about the vehicles here in the collection. They are having an open house in April if you'd like to visit. There's more on that on their own pages, so follow um, the Armor and Cavalry Collection at the links below. And don't forget to check out Arms Trade Tycoon Tanks on Steam. See you guys next time. If you enjoyed the video, let me know what you liked about it down in the comments. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time for another Armored Adventure. Take care.